Welcome to the Think Podcast, the show that helps you lead your family in defending the Christian message. It's the Think Pod 12 Days of Christmas, 12 current cultural challenges answered with timeless biblical truth by me and some of my friends. For more content like this, be sure to follow all our guest hosts and join the Think Squad group on Facebook, Gab, and Signal. So Merry Christmas from the Think Institute and Happy 2022. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we beheld and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, and the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and which was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you may also have fellowship with us, and indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we are writing so that our joy may be made complete. 1 John 1, 1 1-4, Legacy Standard Bible. Man, it really seems like John wants us to believe what he's saying here, doesn't it? But can he be trusted? What about the other authors of the New Testament? Or, Did they have ulterior motives that undermine their trustworthiness? Were they too biased to be objective in what they wrote? What if they weren't trying to report the truth, but rather just to start a movement, or even worse, to gain power and wealth for themselves? Have you ever thought about this? And what if someone brings this challenge to your kids? How prepared are they to answer it? Well, happy third day of Christmas, Think Squad. I'm Joel Sedekes, host of the Think Podcast and founder and lead teacher of the Think Institute. I'm a former pastor, and I want to help you answer this challenge. Can the Bible's authors be trusted? To do that, we're going to discuss three points. One, without God, what's wrong with bias? Two, fairness presupposes the truth of the Bible, and three, the authors of the New Testament can be trusted. Now, we are only focusing on the New Testament authors here for two reasons. One, because the New Testament is the explicit source of the gospel that brings salvation, and we want our apologetics, our defense of the faith, to serve our evangelism. Second, because in the New Testament, Jesus himself authenticates the Old Testament. So, if Jesus is whom the Bible, and the New Testament authors claim him to be, then what he says about the Old Testament is true, and the Old Testament can likewise be trusted. All right, first, without God, what's wrong with bias? So what? Now, our skeptical friend is accusing the authors of the New Testament of not being trustworthy because they are biased. A bias is quote, a preference or inclination, especially one that inhibits impartial judgment. And the idea that the apostles or other authors are not trustworthy because they are not reporting straight facts is what this objection is getting at. Now, sometimes you'll hear a skeptic say that the Bible doesn't count as evidence because it's a religious book. The assumption is that only non-religious or non-Christian evidence would count because they would supposedly be impartial, whereas the Bible is assumed to be partial and biased. However, even if the earliest documents were written by Christians, so what? You can't just dismiss Christian sources. That's not how history is done, even by secular standards. Now, the New Testament contains not just one, but 27 sources all testifying to the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we freely admit that the biblical authors, the New Testament authors, did want their readers to believe in the gospel. We saw that in our quote from 1 John that I read earlier. But does that make them biased such that they aren't necessarily reporting the truth? Does the very fact that someone wants his readers to believe what he is writing mean that he's not writing the truth. Think about that. 
every time you want someone to believe what you're writing, suddenly you're not writing the truth anymore. I mean, that's absurd. So let's get down to brass tacks. Does it really make sense for an unbeliever to accuse New Testament authors of bias as though this is a problem? Let, we need to start here, and then we're going to examine the New Testament documents, all 27 of them. We're not going to write them off simply because they are in the Bible. We're going to examine them to see whether or not bias really is a problem. So first, we're going to look at why bias isn't even a meaningful category for the non-believing world and life view. So think about what this accusation requires in order to stick. For it to work, there must be an absolute universal rule or rules about fairness. Otherwise, what's the objection? You're not being fair, but so what? You're being impartial, you're being biased, but so what? So there needs to be an absolute standard of fairness, but without God, where would that standard come from? Furthermore, along with there being a standard of fairness, rules about bias, it must be wrong morally to break these rules. Otherwise, there's no problem with being biased. But without God, what is the absolute universal standard of rightness by which we could judge it wrong to be biased? Without God, what makes impartiality better than partiality? Now, that might sound a little absurd to you, but we all take it for granted that partiality is bad and impartiality is good. Why? Have you ever stopped and thought about that? It's not an absurd question to ask because every belief that we have has to be in alignment with our fundamental beliefs about the world. So it must be wrong to break the rules of impartiality. And the problem is further compounded, it's complicated, if our friend believes that human beings are merely the product of time and chance acting on matter through an unguided process. In other words, if our friend is a Darwinist, an evolutionist, along with being an atheist, well, there's some major problems here. Why would anyone think that a random process of evolution would produce truth or an ability to make judgments about what is right and wrong? Where do these judgments about these rules come from? So this objection begins with a view, a perspective that excludes God right from the start. And therefore, it can't make sense out of why bias is even a problem. So although the unbeliever might want to come to you and say, first of all, um, I, I reject the biblical sources because they're in a religious book. Well, that's not how history is done. But then even when you begin to examine the books or before you begin to examine them, the objection falls apart anyway, because if you exclude God from the beginning, you can't make sense out of rules about fairness or why it's better to be impartial rather than partial and biased. This objection has no teeth. It doesn't stick. It reduces to absurdity, as the philosophers say, because without God, there is no standard of fairness or morality that would apply here. And so there's really no objection. There's really no problem with the authors being biased. So what? Now, I, of course, do believe that bias is a problem. I do believe that it's better to be fair and impartial, but that's because I'm a Christian and I believe the Bible. So let's talk now about why fairness presupposes the truth of the Bible. Whereas the unbelieving worldview cannot make sense of why bias is a problem and why it's better to be unbiased and impartial than biased and partial, the biblical worldview does not suffer from this problem. There are numerous scripture passages that teach the importance of telling the truth and being accurate, fair, and impartial in what we say. Let me just give you a few of those from both the Old and the New Testaments to show that within the biblical worldview, fairness and impartiality are fundamental and very important values. They're not in an unbelieving worldview, and so the objection falls apart, but within the biblical worldview, they're absolutely important ideas. Exodus 23.1 says, you shall not spread a false report. Proverbs 11.1 says, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Romans 2.11 says, for God shows no partiality. 
Are you getting the picture here? James 2 verse 1 says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, James 3.17 says, the, But the wisdom from above is impartial and sincere. See, the Bible says that God's people are to be accurate, fair, unbiased, and impartial in what we say at all times. This is rooted in God as the absolute standard. God himself shows no partiality, and God's people are to be holy like God, according to 1 Peter 1.15. Therefore, to complain that the apostles and authors of the New Testament cannot be trusted because their supposed uh, partiality, bias, ulterior motives, secretive, sneaky motives. This is to say that you actually do agree with the Bible. If you make this objection, you have to admit that you believe that there is a standard of morality that we should all live up to, and there are rules about how we should accurately report the truth. Those ideas make perfect sense in light of the Bible and what it teaches. And the Bible says those ideas come from God. In other words, to even make this objection, you are presupposing the truth of the biblical worldview and the Christian message. And if you're trying to debunk Christianity, it's probably not a good idea to rely on Christian principles. Just a tip for our unbelieving friends. Now, what we've been doing here is we've been doing an internal critique on the biblical position. We've been showing that the Bible actually makes sense of these principles. So now let's take it even further. We do believe that the Bible says that God's people should be unbiased, impartial, and accurate. So do the authors of the New Testament meet this standard? Let's look at three reasons why we can trust the New Testament authors. The first reason is the radical content of their message. The idea that the apostles would suddenly start to believe that the Messiah had died and come back to life absolutely flew in the face of ancient Jewish belief, the very faith that these men had all been raised to believe. Ancient Judaism had no expectation of a crucified Messiah, nor did they associate resurrection with the Messiah. The resurrection was supposed to happen at the end of the world, and there was no concept that anyone had of anyone else, uh, Messiah or otherwise, being permanently resurrected prior to that last day. The fact that Jesus' followers not only came to believe in his resurrection, but also were willing to die torturous deaths without denying it, indicates that they did truly believe that he had risen from the dead, and that it was a resurrection that was different from other resurrections that are also recorded in Scripture, because this was a permanent resurrection. Now, I mentioned their willingness to suffer and die for this belief. We're going to talk more about that shortly. But suffice it to say, the fact that these Jewish men, not to mention the women who had been accompanying them, all seemed to suddenly start believing something that they had never believed before only makes sense if the events they described actually did happen. So that's very, a very powerful testimony. Now, perhaps the starkest examples of this would be James, the brother of Jesus, and Saul of Tarsus, who became known as the Apostle Paul. Neither of them had believed that Jesus was the Messiah previously. James and the other brothers of Jesus did not believe in Jesus during his earthly ministry. Look at John 7, 5. Paul used to persecute followers of Jesus. Acts 22, 4 talks about that. However, they both, James and Paul, later became completely committed to the idea that Jesus had risen from the dead to the point of dedicating their lives to that truth. Look at Galatians 1.19 and 1 Timothy 1.1. 1, 1. Furthermore, the stories of the New Testament don't have the characteristics that one would expect of writers from that era if they were fabricating a story in order to convince people. Again, their message was radical. Their stories included numerous examples of their own failures. Uh, if they were seeking notoriety and power for themselves, why did they make themselves look so foolish? And furthermore, the inclusion in the gospel stories of women being the first witnesses of the empty tomb would actually have counted against that story being perceived as historical, as true. In fact, just about every culture up until modern times viewed the testimony of a woman as less valuable than that of a man. So we can conclude by the radical inclusion of 
the idea that women were the very first eyewitnesses to the resurrected Lord, that these gospel authors were not just trying to construct a plausible lie. If they were, they would not have made women the first to arrive at the tomb. So the second reason then that we can trust the New Testament authors is the unanimity of their message. The New Testament is made up of 27 books. I mentioned that earlier. Each of these books is its own source. It's another source from the first century testifying to the events of the gospel. And if there are sources from the, oh, and there are sources from the early church era that witnessed the beliefs of the apostles, for example, the writings of Josephus, and from all these early sources, there is nothing at all that indicates that the apostles ever believed anything other than that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. This is the message summarized in 1 Corinthians 15, which at least one apologist believes can be dated to just a few years after the resurrection. And uh, that apologist is Sean McDowell. And uh, Sean McDowell, in an interview that I did with him, uh, here's what he says. If the apostles were biased and intentionally spreading falsehoods, there would be at least some evidence of this in the earliest sources. However, there is none. They were unanimous. They all said the same thing. Sean McDowell talks about this in an interview that I did with him on the ThinkPod. So definitely go check out that episode from our archives. Now, we can finally discuss the, the willingness of the apostles to suffer and die for their message. See, the apostles were willing to suffer and die for their belief that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. It is inconceivable that a liar would die for a lie that he knows to be a lie. Again, arguing from within the biblical worldview, because there is no neutrality, so I have to do that, it makes perfect sense that, as Sean McDowell has put it, quote, the apostles sincerely believed that they had seen the risen Jesus and were willing to put their lives on the line for the sake of that conviction. Contrary to what is sometimes thought, not all the apostles were killed for their belief. However, given the turbulent climate at the time, all of them risked persecution just for publicly declaring that Jesus had risen from the dead and was Lord. In the book, The Fate of the Apostles, Sean McDowell summarizes the argument like this. The apostles spent between one and a half and three years with Jesus during his public ministry, expecting him to perform or to proclaim his kingdom on earth. Although disillusioned at his untimely death, they became the first witnesses of the risen Jesus and they endured persecution. Many subsequently experienced martyrdom, signing their testimony, so to speak, in their own blood. The strength of their conviction, marked by their willingness to die, indicates that they did not fabricate these claims. Rather, without exception, they actually believed Jesus to have risen from the dead. While in and of themselves, these facts prove neither the truth of the resurrection in particular, nor Christianity as a whole, they do demonstrate the apostles' sincerity of belief, lending credibility to their claims about the veracity of the resurrection, which is fundamental to the case for Christianity. In other words, their willingness to face persecution and martyrdom indicates more than any other conceivable course their sincere conviction that, after rising from the dead, Jesus indeed appeared to them. So let's examine a couple possible objections to what we've just learned. First, could there be alternative teachings of the apostles that we don't know about? So maybe their message wasn't unanimous. We just don't know about these other writings. And to this, we say, sure, there could be. I mean, we can imagine anything, but there's no evidence at all for this. And it would fly in the face of all the mountains of evidence that we do have. And Sean McDowell makes this point in my interview with him on the ThinkPod. Second possible objection. Don't people die for their beliefs all the time? Well, yes, they do. However, it's one thing to die for your beliefs that you believe are true. 
even if you learn them from others, it's an entirely different thing to die for claims that you know are false, that you claim to, things that you claim to have witnessed firsthand, but you know are false. See, you alone would know whether or not you were lying or whether or not you were operating based on ulterior motives. The apostles claimed to be eyewitnesses. So the fact that they put themselves in harm's way and that many of them even died meant that they were doing so for for claims that if they were false, they would have known they were false. This separates the apostles from modern-day religious martyrs dying for something that they think is true. So is it conceivable then that the apostles would have died for something that they did not actually believe? Is that even possible? Well, again, there is no evidence for this whatsoever. And the examples of Paul and James dedicating their lives to the gospel and the church make zero sense if they did not actually witness the resurrected Christ. Why would they change sides? However, if Jesus did rise and the gospel is true, then this all makes perfect sense. So this should really make you think about what those biblical authors were writing about. If they are reliable, and we've just seen that they are, then the message they tell us in the Bible is also reliable. That message is this. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried and he was raised to life on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He is the Son of God. And whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. So I wonder, do you believe in Him? If you don't, I hope and pray that you will come to know Him as both Lord and Savior. And for you Christian dads listening to this, I hope and pray that that is the message that you will inculcate to your kids, that they will understand, and that they will follow all the days of their life. So we've seen Three good reasons to believe that the authors of the New Testament were reliable and trustworthy. We've seen how the biblical worldview is necessary to support the importance to lay down a foundation of impartiality and fair testimony, telling the truth. Those are biblical principles. We've seen that. And we've also seen how the unbiblical worldview gives no basis for even thinking that fairness and impartiality, not being biased, is important. So as we put it earlier, what's wrong with bias? So what? Well, I think we answered that question, and we can rest assured that God's Word is reliable. He breathed out every single word of it, and we can trust Him. Join us tomorrow for day four of the ThinkPod 12 Days of Christmas. Okay, that about wraps it up for this episode. The Think Podcast is a production of the Think Institute and is produced by yours truly, Joel Sedeckes. The Think Institute operates under Church Movements, a ministry of Crew under the division of Crew City. To learn about how to support the Think Institute and my family tax-free, go to thethink.institute slash partner. I hope you heard something helpful today. I know I did. Remember, this is not goodbye. This has just been a short stop on the journey as we learn to lead our families in defending the Christian message. And we'll see you next time. Until then, I hope it made you think. 